Well, once again, welcome to uh, this class, a workshop on what does it mean to be a moderator. And I want to explore um, how the moderator uniquely serves as a key person. And I want to look at that from four uh, elements, faith, mission or purpose, advocacy, and vision. And we're going to uh, study these principles, if you will, of leadership through uh, New Testament examples so that we're able to take what's been given to us in the treasures of Scripture and to infuse those into our church or our association and to see how the, the moderator plays a very unique role in leadership. Um, just by way of background, a bit about myself, uh, I am the pastor of the Latham Community Baptist Church. I've been there about nine years and uh, First Baptist Saratoga Springs for three years and the moderator at Cabra for about five years. But before that, I worked as the director of security for the uh, Navy Nuclear Propulsion Program. So I was responsible for, uh, for counterterrorism, counterespionage programs at the facilities that designed and manufactured the uh, nuclear reactor systems for our submarines and aircraft carriers. And this was a particularly helpful, it uh, doesn't look like that's sort of a great, great mission uh, uh, pastoral training ground, but it really was because this was probably the most critical and self-critical organization you could ever imagine, right? You know, so when you made a decision, it wasn't, oh, could you please explain this to me? It was like, are you crazy? <laughs> you know, and, and that's how people started. As a result of that, going into the ministry, it served me well because I can no longer be insulted. <laughs> So ask any question, throw out any comment you want at me, it's not going to insult me, okay? Um, I'm a graduate of the Nehemiah Leadership Network, which is an American Baptist network. My mentor was Lynn Sullivan right here, and that was a, a great uh, uh, opportunity. I was with a small cohort of people, and I'll relate these two that... One of the things that I, I told the cohort group about was that uh, one time we were running some security exercises at one of our facilities, and it was simulated that somebody had penetrated the facility with a backpack, and then it was seen leaving an area without it. And so the security force was dispersed and to try and find this backpack and what was, whether it was a device, or an explosive device, or what have you. And so one of the officers went about 50, 60 yards up and looked in a closet area and believed that he saw the backpack. So rather than radio, he signaled back to his supervisor, thumbs up, right? And the supervisor who sees this thumbs up radios back, we have confirmation on the bomb. Well, one of the drill observers was with the uh, supervisor and said, what does this thumbs up signal mean? He said, well, it means there's a bomb there. Can this mean anything else? And he said, yeah, everything's good. <laughs> so it either was everything's good or there was a bomb. So we used to talk about this after that among the group that said, any time anybody gave up, got up and gave a presentation, you say, how did I do? You went. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm expecting thumbs up when this is all over with, okay? Uh, we went through, I went through training as a mediator with the Mennonite Peace Center, which is a, uh, a week-long process. Jim was part of that as well as several other people from the region. I did an executive integral leadership training program at Notre Dame. That was uh, really an intensive, think of it as a, an intensive class. It was a uh, week long, 16 hours a day, and, and it was really a pretty interesting uh, uh, discussion, and I'll bring some of that in. I was trained as a court-appointed special advocate for abused and neglected children. And the reason why I, I throw this in is 
one of the things that they they taught us is that you have to listen when you listen to somebody's story story is everything right that's how we learn almost everything is through the power of story and what they taught you there was that you really need three sets of ears to hear somebody's story you need one set of ears to hear the words that are being spoken to you you need a second set of ears to listen to the silence we don't do very well at listening to silence but when you're talking to a kid you want to hear what are they telling me what are they not telling me and then you need a set of ears to feel what they're saying this is an invaluable uh, commodity if you will in leadership you have to be able to listen to the story that somebody's telling you in what they're saying what they're omitting and then what they're feeling so I I add that in um, I was uh, at one time could do engineering that's long gone uh, but I graduated with a BS in, in engineering and then before I retired from federal service I went back and got my master's of uh, divinity and so that's just a, a way of introduction and some of these elements you'll you'll hear mentioned as we go along um, the moderator is sort of an interesting topic I did some uh, research on bylaws and uh, constitutions and what you find is that the, it, the role sort of breaks down to um, to really one major role and then some functions that are very common and if you look at most constitutions and most bylaws there's not a lot said about the duties of the moderator but in general they are an officer of the organization that's true of church and that's true of of an association invariably it will talk about the moderator being the chair of the annual meeting the blessed annual meeting right uh, and uh, that they will oftentimes function now particularly as churches um, sort of consolidate uh, uh, the organizations from multiple boards to a single board you'll often read that the moderator becomes the the chair of the leadership team or whatever name is given to that sometimes it's called church council but oftentimes the moderator will fall uh, to that category and then the uh, catch-all is that the moderator often will uh, find people in between annual meetings when there's a vacancy that needs to be filled and they'll do an appointment and try to coordinate committees and then very unusually you'll find that the uh, moderator is described as the president of the corporation having the duties uh, that was particular uh, in Massachusetts so I just wanted to uh, to cover those and we're going to we're going to expand and look at each of these roles just a little bit and they may be different in your in your context so I'll speak a little bit generically but the the common role I want to talk about is that the moderator is the key is a key leader and so this ultimately what we're going to talk about here today is about leadership 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 because you are leaders that's different than somebody who's a manager that's different from somebody who's an administrator and we're going to differentiate what does it mean to be a leader not a manager not an administrator sometimes people think those are all the same they're they're not they're very different and so the moderator is as far as I can tell is always elected okay so it's it's an elected position and they serve as the primary representative if you're at the association level you are the primary representative of your association body okay or you are the primary lay leader of your church the primary lay leader uh, the only one one uh, constitution I saw where uh, the pastor is also the moderator but that was sort of the outlier um, and 
the bylaws typically contain, you know, extensive qualifications for a pastor who is, you know, your, your spiritual leader. But it contains almost no qualification requirements to be a moderator. And it's sort of interesting that, that as a leadership position, there's none. Okay? There's no discernible requirements. And yet, uh, it's, you're, you're occupying a, an extremely important position. So let's talk about some of the common functions. Oftentimes it says that the moderator is responsible for setting the agenda for the leadership or annual meetings. Um, and agenda uh, is sort of interesting because there's two ways I've seen people set agendas. Uh, the most common way I've seen is a moderator will go to the church secretary or the church clerk and said, could you print me the agenda from last year and change the dates? <laughs> That's not setting an agenda. That's an administrative task. Okay? Setting an agenda for a meeting means that as a leader, you're setting the tone for that meeting. You are setting the example of how we're going to conduct the, the business. We're there to, to set the agenda is to get everybody on the same page. Uh, so we have to keep in mind that simply printing last year's and changing the dates on a piece of paper so that we get you know, old business, new business, you know, report, that's not setting the agenda. That's an administrative task. Um, so that's, that's sort of a, a key one that I want to point out that there's a difference between administrative and leadership. Uh, the moderator is responsible for overseeing and coordinating boards, committees, and commissions. That's, <clears throat> that's another one that's there where the, the moderator sort of serves as that um, person that's supposed to generally know what everybody else is doing so that uh, there's some level of coordination. This is starting to this particular role, I believe, is starting to get smaller as we disband individual boards and become a unified board. And you would think then that that makes the moderator's job easier. No, it makes the moderator's job much more difficult because now it's a true leadership position. There's no uh, just reading minutes or checking in once in a while. To me, the moderator is a leader and it is he or she is by their ability to influence others. That is the classic definition of what leadership is. If you cannot influence another person, you are not leading. You know, hey everybody follow me and you turn around and there's no one there. Well you're not a leader because you influenced no one. So Influence is important in our conversation, and I want to talk a bit about that. Uh, and our way we can influence people is really by three different sorts of authority that we have. There's what we would call defined authority, meaning you have a constitution that says the moderator or whatever title, position we want to talk about, has the authority to do X, Y, and Z. The trustees, for example, I heard there's somebody over here that's in trustees. The trustees have the authority to spend money. That's an authority that's given to them in a bylaw or a constitution. So that's sort of a, a defined authority. Uh, and they have that authority because the constitution or the bylaws says they do. The second is a derived authority. And that's the authority that we have because historically our predecessors had a particular way of operating and we've now inherited that mode of operation. And, and so that's just sort of historical practices. And you can see that in churches all over the place that says, well, this is the way we've... Okay, and so even if you say, well, show me in the Constitution where it says that board or that group has that authority, you probably, you may in some cases can't, but everybody's sort of okay with it because that's the way we've always done it. Well, that's a derived authority 
from your um, from this the historical practices. The last one, and this to me is the most is one of the most important ones, is an inferred authority. Meaning, I have this authority as a leader because of the personal behavior and conduct that I exhibit. And this is not a transferable authority. When I um, finished my 33 years in, in federal service, I had a tremendous amount of inferred authority. Meaning, George says this is what he wants done. People did it. Even though they didn't have to go find some manual that said that was okay, it was done. The minute I retired and walked out the door and my successor came in, that was gone. And so we see that sometimes in church life where somebody was able to accomplish things. They retire, they die, they move, what have you. And someone else comes in and they think they're going to act that way? Oh no. Right? Get an amen? amen. <laughs> that was an inferred authority that was given only to that person because of the way they had the ability to influence others. So sometimes conflict comes in because we're operating on a different authority than we thought we had. So you want to make sure if you're a moderator, think about, I have this authority, why? Because the Constitution says I do, because our historical practices say I do, or is it really an inferred authority that's vested in you or it was invested in someone else and <laughs> is not being transferred to you? The interesting thing about the moderator is there's virtually no training materials on it at all. We have, of course, the work of the pastor, the associate pastor, deacons, trustees, and, and the usher. But I could not find a book on the moderator. So if we come through this successfully and you suffer through these, maybe there'll be a book deal in it for me. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't think you make a lot of money, but uh, we may have some fun. And, and I'll, I'll uh, put you in as uh, having suffered through the, uh, the discussion the first time around. And so why this is particularly important from a leadership perspective is, as I say, the trend tends, it seems to be headed in the direction of fewer discrete boards and more unified boards. And so if we don't really know what the moderator's function is, um, then these are some of the things that come up. And this is why I'm glad you're here, because we don't have, we mentioned before, we don't have any qualifications identified for a moderator in our, in our constitutions. We don't have any training materials. So what this creates is functional risk. Those functions that were there that the moderator has to do, we create some functional risks. And one of those is the risk of uncertainty. And um, what happens there is when there's uncertainty in the part of a leader, they're, well, what do I do? I'm the leader now, what do I do? And so what they're going to do most often, if they're uncertain, is mimic the person who preceded them. Okay? Uh, I'm familiar with a church where I could, if I had, you know, a transcript, if you will, of the annual meeting that was just, just occurred uh, with the current moderator, with last year's with a different moderator, with five years ago with a different moderator, and I just put those transcripts next to each other, you couldn't tell who was the moderator. Because what they're saying is identical. Because they're uncertain of their role as a leader. Okay? The other one is you can get someone who becomes overbearing. They really take on this mantle of leadership. I am the primary leader of the congregation. And there was uh, a leader, a moderator in a church I was familiar with who got up at a, at a meeting. It was a special meeting. It wasn't an annual meeting. And he folded his arms like this 
and he looked at everyone and he said, we're here to talk about this one issue, this one issue only. We're going to have an open and frank conversation about it. And if you don't think that we should be approving this, you really should be checking your attitude at the door. Now let's have a good meeting. <laughs> well, what do you think of that? That's overbearing. I am in charge. There's one answer, mine. And you must see to it that you vote accordingly. Uh, so they take that to the max because there's no, there's nothing there to uh, to help. So that's a functional risk. Uh, another functional risk is minimization. Uh, I'm familiar with a church uh, doesn't exist anymore, uh, in which they had <coughs> taken the role of moderator and really kept reducing it. They didn't want a leader as a moderator, and the person that they chose to be moderator didn't want to lead. So it was a perfect match. And so what the moderator really did, and again, if you had the transcripts from meeting to meeting to meeting, it would go something like this. Um, could, could, ev could everybody just take your seats now? We want to get this meeting over with quickly. Um, I say the meeting's open. I, I want to thank the women's group for once again putting on such a lovely luncheon that we couldn't have done it without you. Round of applause, please. Pastor, quick prayer. Meetings is going. Hopefully, he didn't have to say anything else, and then he would say, meeting adjourned. Mm -hmm. Once a year, that's what the moderator did. That's not leadership. I'm not degrading the guy. That's what they wanted. But that's not leadership. You are here because you are leaders in the church. Uh, the other risk is we, well, at work we do da 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 da, right? Well, th there's some benefit to that, but there's some great risks. We are not a business. And we can't just take and appropriate every single business uh, idea and incorporate it into church. And so what happens with this uh, uncertainty and lack of qualifications is we start avoiding risk, we start uh, getting stagnant, and then we, we sort of have rote, rote behavior, gavel in, gavel out, and you, you look at it and you say, wow, this, was, uh, this wasn't really a very productive and encouraging meeting, or this wasn't uh, uh, much of an example for me to kind of sink my teeth into. So those are the risks that we face, and so I think it's, I, I really do applaud New York Region for bringing together uh, this opportunity to talk about leadership, uh, particularly by the moderator. So our approach today is going to be leadership training. I don't know if you've been through any leadership training. Some of it's good, some of it's not but we can all give it a thumbs up, right? <laughs> um, we're going to do it scripturally based. I'm going to use a scripturally based model of leadership. Uh, I think this is going to serve us well. And you're going to see that this can be applied either to, the, to an association setting or to a church setting. And I'm desperately asking you to make it interactive. There'll be some points where I'll, I'll specifically pause for questions or comments or cross-table discussion. But please, if you have a question as I'm going along, shoot it out. If I say something that you think is offensive, let me know, because I don't intend to offend anybody. Paul. Um, a lot of what you've drawn on is from um, what churches have been doing. Are there any legal or state requirements for a moderator or the moderator's role? As far as I can tell, in, in church governance, the only thing I've seen is uh, statements about the pastor and trustees, as far as the state legal requirements. There are American Baptist churches that do not have moderators, not because they can't find anybody to fill them. Their constitution is there is no moderator. They, they, uh, in fact, that's what First Baptist Saratoga Springs is. It's a church without any moderator position. And so they tend to uh, either pick somebody to be moderator for the meeting. So it's a, it's a very different organizational structure. Um, and we could probably talk about that more off camera. But uh, 
So let's, um, let's talk about the four biblical leadership qualities of a moderator. Now, these are my personal selections based on the study I did of, uh, of New Testament. Uh, there are, as you can imagine, there are uh, many, many leadership qualities that we could talk about, dozens, um, but we really would kind of dilute our efforts if we did that. And so I really picked on four, and I want to map those back to, um, the, uh, to the New Testament, and I divided them between two things. One is sort of who you are your core beliefs, who, who the person is, and then how do you live that out? So, um, and we're going to talk in detail about each one of these, and we're going to talk about some case studies, uh, and, and so I really, really want to uh, hone in on that. Uh, this gives us who we are and our core beliefs and the way we, we interact. That gives us our inferred authority. That's where that's going to come from. Right? Who you are is important to how you will operate as a moderator. Your living out is your capacity for derived authority, where you can get practices put in place that people say, you know what, we really want to model that, and we want our successors to model that. And so it's important uh, from a leadership perspective to, to see these um, come into play. Anybody have any dispute about how I kind of divided things up and how we'll govern our time? Uh, I should have said in the beginning, if, if you need to use the restroom, please don't hesitate. I did build in a break. Um, so let's, with that, let's kind of roll up our sleeves and, and get into the, the specifics. So the first uh, biblical leadership quality of the moderator is a person of faith, okay? And this is not something that you would find necessarily spoken this way in a business setting. They're not going to talk about people of, people of faith. And there are four things under a person of faith that I think are important. Uh, the first is that you're committed. Now, that sounds a bit shallow, but, you know, um, Paul says to, to this end, I contend strenuously all my energy uh, Christ so powerfully uh, for Christ who so powerfully works within me. There really has to be a commitment to Christ. There has to be a commitment to your church or to your, to your association. And it can't be shallow. It can't, be can't find anybody else to serve that moderator role. I guess I'll do it. That's not commitment. Commitment is, I've thought about it, I've prayed about it, and I am committed to using my energy for this position of leadership. Okay? The second is, you've got to be a person of, of action. You know, we, we remember that James said, in the same way, faith by itself, if not accompanied by action, is dead. So, it has to be action. Now, going to the church secretary and saying, please print me last year's agenda and change the dates is not really a person of action. Right? That's an administrative thing. That's not a leadership thing. It's about how do we work at this thing of governance, and governance the church. Um, so there really has to be some action. And our faith yielding action must be righteous. It must have a right nature to it. Um, you know, for righteousness of God is revealed from faith, and faith, uh, it's by righteousness shall we live by faith, is what Paul says. So it's, there's got to be a commitment, there's got to be actions, but then the actions have to have that tonal quality and direction that we're moving the church forward. Not personally, but we're moving the church. And then finally, there has to be a submission or submittedness in our nature. We have to remember, yes, I'm a leader, but I am a servant leader. So we need to get that element of servanthood in there. I'm not in charge to 
push people around. I'm here to serve as a servant leader. And that means you have to submit to the authority of your church or your association. You can't run outside it. You're not in charge of, of, uh, of everything that way. But you have to be submitted. And so let's take these um, a little bit further. And we're going to, um, we're going to begin with um, um, a, a bit of a pop quiz. So let's start in uh, Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 2. I'll read this in case it's difficult for you. It says, In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach, and until the day he was taken up into heaven, after giving instructions um, through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. And Jesus said to them, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and into the ends of the earth. So I'm going to throw out a pop quiz, maybe a little bit uh, tricky. But which apostle do you think is for association moderator? Which one do you think we're going to pick? Just throw out a name. Peter. Peter. Anybody else? Paul. Paul? James. James. John. John. You ready for the answer? Mm -hmm. Ever hear of the Apostle Joseph? Huh? Well, let's go to the next one. Now I've got you intrigued, right? <laughs> So the, the role model we're going to pick is, with great power, the apostles continue to, to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's grace was so powerful at work in them that there was no needy persons among them. From the time to time, those who owned land and houses sold them, brought the money to, from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. And so we're going to look at the apostle Barnabas, or Joseph, and when we start thinking about that, we, we go back to uh, Acts chapter 14, 14, where it says, but when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard of this, they tore their clothes and rushed into the crowd. So Barnabas is described as a apostle. Another pop quiz, just to kind of give us a little bit of distraction. How many apostles are there? Well, it was 12. Well, we thought it was 12. It was 12 original. Then it was Matthias, who would have been 13. Paul would have been 14. Well, it turns out that um, there are uh, 26 people who are named as apostles in the New Testament. If you go to the uh, Eastern Orthodox Church, they believe it's 70 or 72. I've, I'm a little bit confused on that. Uh, and and they, just, they ascribe apostleship to everyone that Jesus sent out two by two as apostles. So you can have a great... Great fun time with that on uh, how many apostles are there. Well, we picked Barnabas. I picked Barnabas here. Um, and he's going to be our role model as the first moderator of the early church. Okay? And we're going to see some of this play out. Uh, and it turns out he was a leader of exceptional quality. Anybody ever study Barnabas? Okay, great. Well, uh, then you won't know if I'm right or not. Right? <laughs> um, <laughs> but he, he had almost no uh, derived, uh, defined authority because there was no constitution, no bylaws. What a great church, huh? <laughs> and, uh, but he had a tremendous amount of inferred authority because of the way he was, the way he behaved. And that had such tremendous impact 
on the on the early church. And so we want to begin by looking at each of those uh, elements that we talked about uh, and look at Barnabas as a person of faith. And so he's described as a Levite from Cyprus uh, and he was given this nickname of son of encouragement. And so if we start looking at Barnabas as a quality of a good Christian leader, you know, that he was committed, actions, righteousness, and submitted, he was committed to following the way, right? He was a Levite who gave his life to Christ fully, completely. There wasn't anything that he held back. He was a person of action. He sold his own property and gave it over to the church. So all of you who are moderators, go home and sign your deeds over to the church. There's a little footnote in your constitution. Uh, but he was a person of action. It wasn't just, I'm committed. I am into this with action. And he was righteous. It wasn't just actions of selling his land, but his actions were the form of encouragement. And so he had that gift of encouragement and he used it. And we're going to talk more about that later because sometimes I think we, we think about an encouraging leader as somebody who's there, come on, you know, team, we can do this. You know, that's the encourager. That's not what they're talking about here. That's not the leadership of encouragement that, Paul, that Barnabas was using. And we're going to see how he put that into play. It's, it's much, this, is, this gives too much of a flat affect to what encouragement meant. Barnabas really pushed the envelope tremendously. And he was submitted. He gave the money over. He gave his position of status, if you will, over to the church. He was willing to follow the lead of his, um, of his own leaders. And so we have this uh, quick snapshot here that says he was very much a person of faith. Uh, and that's sort of our first um, understanding from the New Testament of how this plays out in the role of a moderator. So we go on and we say, well, a person of faith as a moderator, how do we now take that as an application to ourselves? Well, the moderator must be a person possessing the qualities of a good leader, committed, uh, action-oriented, righteous, submitted. And, you know, we're going to have some, some fun today with some uh, back and forth, but we really have to be ask ourselves some very serious questions at this point. You know, are we committed? Are we stepping into a role of leadership? Are we really serious about this? And are we serious for Christ? If we're not, we shouldn't be in a leadership position. Doesn't mean we can't do some tremendous work elsewhere. But when you decide you're going to be a leader, you really got to make that a conscious decision, not a default. If nobody else will do it, I guess I'll do it. That's not a positive decision. We don't make our commitment to Christ that way, right? We don't say, well, nobody else went up to the altar call. I guess I'll go up. That's not, that's not a commitment to Christ. Well, we shouldn't commit to leadership by default. Do we have a servant's heart? Do we want to make these actions and be a servant heart? Now, I'm not here to challenge anybody's personal faith. I'm just saying that it has to be we have to do that self-examination if we're going to go into a leadership position. Righteousness. Am I willing to do the next right thing for God, even if it doesn't feel like the next right thing for me? That can be very difficult for people. Very difficult to say, I know this is what we should be doing, even though uh, there may be a cost to me. Uh, and then we have to respect the authority of our church or our association. We have to. And we got to remember it's not our church. It's Christ's church. We have to remember that there is a, a, a structure, and so we have to stay somewhat within it. Um, and so I used to, people would say to me, well, do you really 
do that. Well, at work, you know, I followed every order I agreed with, so I, <laughs> I, I stayed within the structure as much as I could. Um, so we want to be that person of faith. So let's, let's, uh, let's take a pause for a moment and let's talk about that. How do you see that play out? Do you see the relationship that we're trying to build between Barnabas and our mo uh, you as moderators? Anybody have any questions, disputes about that without being a person of faith, you really shouldn't be in church leadership? Any thoughts? Don't leave me hanging. <laughs> no, it makes sense because when, as a pastor, when I'm trying to explain something about Jesus, frankly, um, and how he lived, how I see that he lived his life, I need somebody to understand that, you know. I mean, people cherry pick scripture all the time and can, you know, live their lives according to the scripture that they, like you say, the one they, that they agree with, right. you know. But how do you, how do you live your life in accordance with scripture, even when you don't always agree with what it says, right. you know, and there's the rub. Yes. And so you, in, in, when you have some, a moderator or someone in that key leadership role, you need somebody who's going to look beyond their own self-interest for the good of the, the institution. Amen. So for, in case that didn't pick up on, on the tape, when, uh, Wendy was talking as a pastor that, you know, when you get up there and you're, you're giving the message about Christ, what you're looking for is, an, is for people to accept all of Christ and to then live it incarnationally, meaning you live it every single day, even if there's a cost to living it. That's faith. And that she's you know, reflecting that that's ultimately what a pastor wants to see come back from particularly leadership is that they live it incarnationally. They live their faith. And that's really what we're talking about here. Because if you are a leader and you live it incarnationally, you will bring along others with you. But if you do not, you become the stumbling block. So leadership, this is why I wanted to get away from, you know, what does a moderator do, gavel in, gavel out. It's leadership. It's critical. And so I appreciate Wendy's, you know, pastoral comment here that, that we want to see our leaders live it out. And, and I think that's what we're going to find as we, as we explore here, that Barnabas really lived it out. And that we can bring that in. Lynn. George, I think another aspect is that any church leader would need to keep the big picture of uh, the purpose of our particular faith community. What is God calling our community to do and to be? Right. And to understand that and to be able to communicate that to others. So, again, for the benefit of the, of the camera, Lynn was mentioning, you got to know what the purpose is of the church and keep that in mind as you're going forward. And, and um, so... You know, this was not staged, but um, the second quality of leadership by the, per by, the, by the moderator is they must be a person of purpose, which is what you're saying, is you have to keep that purpose in mind. And the reason that's so critical is we, if we lose that in context of what we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis, then the day-to-day -day things become our purpose. You know, you remember there was years ago, uh, and we used to, we appropriated the comment in, in work was, there was that Dunkin' Donuts commercial of the guy, you know, he's slogging to work and time to make the donuts, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, sometimes churches can get into that mode of time to make donuts, and we just kind of, and we've kind of, all of a sudden, what am I doing here? And we're going to talk about that because if we lose purpose, wow, we're in trouble. And that's a leadership issue. And so I want to 
go on. We got thumbs up for everybody else on. Uh, all right, so uh, so I want to go right to this because a per the the second is the moderator must be a person of purpose, and with that comes understanding and stability. Those are two things we're going to talk about uh, a bit here because um, they must be a person of purpose. Now. I worked with many organizations over my years and in some churches in which they were action oriented. Okay? But they operated what I called the the uh, the mode of win in danger, win in doubt, run in circles, scream and shout. <laughs> and they were action oriented. But it had no purpose. And so what happens in that is you start getting conflict. That never gets resolved. And without purpose, every single thing you do has equal merit. And it really doesn't. Because they had lost purpose, the reason for which something existed. And does anybody remember, I know it was a few minutes ago, what was the purpose statement that Jesus gave the apostles? Three words. Yeah, three words. Be my witnesses. That's a purpose statement. And you can remember it. You can repeat it. I, I, I didn't bring it with me because I didn't want to take the time, but I did a study one time of purpose statements of churches. And some of them are two pages. I defy anybody to be able to state the purpose statement. Jesus said it in three words. Be my witnesses. Peter said, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possessions, that you may proclaim his excellencies. Is a purpose statement. So we need to remember our purpose. And so let's take a look. We're going to go back into the New Testament now and talk about Barnabas again as a person of purpose. And so we go to Acts chapter 9. It says, when he, Saul, now remember, Saul has now entered the picture, came to Jerusalem, he, Saul, tried to join the disciples. But they were afraid of him. Afraid of Saul. Not believing that Saul was a disciple. But, okay, it, I, I guarantee you this, the most theologically important word you're going to learn today is but. Every time you're reading the scriptures and you see the word but, stand up, take notice, because it's, it's there to change your perspective on what else is going on. How many times did Jesus say, well, you know, you've heard it said, hate your enemies. But, I say, look for the buts. And we'll maybe have a little video on buts later. <laughs> but Barnabas took Saul. Okay? Barnabas stepped in when others were fearful. The disciples wanted nothing to do with Saul. But Barnabas. So he acted. He was a person of action. And he took charge over Saul. And what did he do? He listened. He listened to what Paul or Saul said. He listened to what Saul didn't say. He listened to what Saul felt. He listened to Saul's testimony. He wasn't afraid. He went and listened. And he learned of Jesus' post-ascension appearance to Saul. This was new. And he affirmed, and, and that affirmed the church's broad purpose mission, to proclaim my name to the Gentiles, is what Paul heard. Again, to proclaim my name. Now it's four words of the purpose statement, to proclaim my name. And Barnabas started exercising some understanding of purpose, and he understood even better than most, what the purpose was for the church that Jesus had created. 
So he had understanding. He had stability. He was emotionally confident. He overcame whatever fear he had so that he could consider Paul's testimony as God at work. He didn't let fear consume him. And we're going to talk a bit about how that happens and why it's so critical as a leader not to let fear overcome you. So Barnabas understood purpose, and so he was attuned to opportunities that God was putting in front of him. And so Saul comes into the picture, and it's like, wow, listen to this story. Person of purpose. He didn't get distracted by fear. He knew what the purpose was. So let's talk about that in application form. A person of purpose, the moderator. You are to be a person of purpose. You have to understand the purpose or the mission of your association. Okay? And you have to be emotionally secure enough to face uncertainty without it consuming you. All right? That's, that's really uh, very significant that we understand that. And that means that it's, it's innate. This, this becomes part of us. When I worked um, for the federal government, one of the things that would, was occurring and is you would get a, somebody would, I called it the flavor of the month, or, you know, oh, it, it's all about, you know, terrorism, <coughs> let's say. And so everybody, you know, jumps and creates new programs and this and that, all about terrorism. Well, you get about halfway through, and the next issue comes in, and now it's not terrorism today, it's espionage. And so that's done, and, and you got all of these half-done things everywhere. The government, I know this is going to shock you, isn't very efficient. <laughs> um, and so one of the things that, that I looked at was saying, we can't do this. Let's set our principles of how we're going to operate. What's our purpose? And then as new things come along, we'll factor those nuances into our purpose. Because these things can distract you from what you're trying to do. And so as a leader in your church, you have to always have the purpose in mind. If you don't have the purpose in mind, things can get very uh, imbalanced very quickly. So I would encourage you to really be thinking about um, your purpose. Um, and then to have some emotional stability about that. Um, so let's, let's take a look at this uh, person of and, and do a little bit of a, a sort of a case study, if you will, using uh, uh, the Capital Area Baptist Association. Not that we have it right, but we're at least trying to exercise some of these principles. And so we, we begin with the question, you know, why are, why are you here? And, um, and, and that's really kind of an interesting uh, first order question. Why are you here? And so we had sort of arrived at a point in Cabo where we couldn't give a good answer to that question. People were struggling, saying, you know, why are you here? W what is the purpose for us to even gather? Um, and so I went back and started looking at our annual reports. Uh, you know, who likes to read annual reports? Well, there's some pretty interesting things if you do sort of a, uh, a backward look to say, well, here's where we are. What can I see out of that? And what I found was that about 20 years before we came to this point of, of confusion, you could start seeing sort of distress signs coming into the reports. Um, words like, well, membership is declining, destructive polarization issues are there, we have the graying of the churches, and it's sort of this, uh, you know, kind of malaise, if you will. Um, and, um, and then there was this one statement that said, uh, this past year held many challenges and many things to ponder. Okay. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> Very insightful, right? <laughs> right. And then <laughs> we got to the point where, um, well, and I guess I, I would comment a bit about that, that that is not a leadership statement, okay? When you read statements like that, that is not leadership. That is, you know, something else, but it's not leadership. And then we get to the point where 10 years ago there were reports where the moderator didn't even bother to write a report. And so you say, hmm, I guess we stopped pondering. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then we looked at the Constitution, and it was seven pages long, uh, 2,337 words, and it defined an advisory board, a board of trustees, three commissions, numerous requirements none of which had been met for decades. That was our, our kind of our condition. And so we, we did this you know, sort of ins assessment. It wasn't formal and it wasn't documented, but it was sort of, hey, let's talk about this. Some of you may be familiar with the term SWOT, S-W-O-T, which is let's go through and catalog our strengths, our weaknesses, our opportunities and threats. It's a very classical, approach that many corporations use, I know some churches use, where you just sort of brainstorm. You know, what are, what are the strengths of our organization? What are our weaknesses? What's the opportunities that we see coming? And what are the threats? So SWOT. Um, I, I really wasn't prepared to talk about that in any great detail, but it's a type of an analysis where you just kind of take stock of where you are. And so we took stock of where we were, and we were very fortunate, I think it was more divine uh, 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 work here, is that when we kind of finished that up, there was this program called Mission from the Gospels. Uh, Jim Kelsey had in, invited his way in, I think, to be the sort of the uh, pilot program for Mission from the Gospels, which was uh, an American Baptist um, home mission society sponsored um, uh, program, I guess, and the, the developers, um, Ron Carlson and Sam Brink, uh, were test driving it before they rolled it out. So we, we glommed on to that because uh, their, their fundamental question was, you know, how do you read the Gospels? Uh, the hope and the intention of the journey that they were trying to create was to read the Gospels through the lens of mission, lens of purpose, and to see how we could uh, sort of enliven our churches today. And, and so that helped us to get better focused on, on here's where we are, how are we supposed to go forward, and then what, how do we put these puzzles together? I like this uh, particular comment about purpose that, you know, because God has a mission, right? God's the one with the mission. A church arises, and apart from the mission, the church is meaningless. If you don't know your purpose, it's very difficult to have meaning, because you're not sure Am I doing what I'm supposed to do? And so we were very fortunate at the time that we started doing this self-discovery that um, we had this mission from the gospel that helped us sort of think afresh, reaffirm our, um, our approaches. And so we did this uh, informal study again and and from this, we started putting pieces together. And we came up with, um, our final step was to affirm our purpose. You know, our purpose is to serve the Lord Jesus Christ by promoting evangelism, mission, and a ministry among its members. That was the historic purpose statement in our Constitution. Uh, I would like it smaller and shorter, but it was okay, you know, it was, it was fine. And <clears throat> so we affirmed that in our, uh, in our Constitution. You have copies of the Constitution. Uh, it's now two pages, 830 words. It has one leadership team. So we skinnied it down and we said, 
We need to be nimble. We need to be doing what this really says, is how are we going to promote this. And it wasn't by having lots of, of committees and, and uh, commissions that really weren't functioning. And the way we work now is if there's a need for something that shouldn't be, shouldn't be handled by the leadership team or is not best handled by the leadership team, then we form a group just for that purpose. And when that purpose is served, it's gone. It doesn't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. So for example, you know, we have somebody that's going through uh, accept, uh, recognizing the ordination that they have in the, I think it's a Presbyterian church to become recognized by American Baptist. So we have a group that's working on that. When that's over with, they're gone as, as a group. We're not going to carry on if there's no work for them to do. And this helps us to get volunteers because they know there's a beginning, a middle, and an end. And it's not like, you know, once you get on the committee, you can't get off. All right. Well, you can because it's a defined uh, opportunity. The other thing that we did was we created sort of a, a, a secondary document which you have attached to the, to the uh, um, Constitution. And this is this has not been approved by the association and will never be approved by the association. It is the guidance that the leadership team developed for itself and can change on its own. We do not need to go back through a laborious process. And from that process, what we said was that we will have a vision to see that we share our love among our churches and with others and our vision is that we have healthy churches and then these, this is the approach that the leadership team is going to use in discharging its responsibilities. If something else, again, it's back to the flavors of the month, if something comes along, we now have a structure to integrate into the way we do our business. And these are principles. They're not you know, hard and fast requirements. So yes, we have to respect the diversity in our Catholic churches. They're very diverse. There's theological differences, but we don't focus on those. We focus on what we share in common. There's uh, geographical differences, urban, suburban, uh, rural churches. So we recognize and we accept that there's going to be differences in ministry. Um, we strengthen the leadership of our churches. Uh, and, and so we do leadership training, and I'll talk about some of that coming up here in a minute. We encourage the churches through difficult times. Um, First Baptist Church, Saratoga Springs, was going through a difficult time. And so uh, Region was helping, and, and then Cabot came alongside and said, let's create a vision team where we can start doing that informal assessment, tell your story, let's work through this, let's understand where are we, where do we want to go? And so that's an encouragement to churches in difficult times. That's not the encouragement of, you know, guys, just keep at it, keep swinging. You know, you're going to hit the ball eventually, you know, swing, swing enough times. Uh, that's not encouragement. Encouragement is you actually walk with somebody. Uh, and then we're sparking new approaches to reaching people for Christ every year. Now, instead of uh, kind of saving on the money for who knows what purpose, CABA has resources to say to all of the churches, if you want a grant, $1,000, to go start something, try something, one page, and anybody ever do a grant? There's no such thing as a one-page grant, let me tell you. And what it is is, tell us what you'd like to spend the money on, how you're going to, you know, something new, and then tell us how it went. Give it a try. And it's okay to fail. Not that we want it squandered, but we want you to try. And so that's what we're trying to do, is spark some, some new approaches and, and give people that opportunity. So in the, the strengthening uh, of our churches, we've, we've now done uh, missions from the Gospels. We did Bridges Out of Poverty. I don't know if anybody's ever done that. We did that for our group. Uh, we did healthy congregations with some financial support from uh, from Jim, and that was 
and we've opened this up, I think, to region every time. Uh, what does a healthy congregation look like? So we're trying to strengthen our congregations. We did missions for small churches. What can a small church do in local missions? Uh, we did one on how do small churches actually function and how do you empower them to move forward. We did one on soul shop. Anybody? Ever? That's for how do you reach out to people who are suicidal, right? Huge problem. And so we tried to strengthen that way. And I mentioned the, the grants, and now we have churches working on some collaborative efforts of joint ministry, where one church will send money or product to another church to say, here, you go do this for your ministry. Is it perfect? No. But we're trying to work through that process of being faithful and having a purpose in mind. And so we're, we're working on it. But that's the direction um, that, we, that we are pursuing. So that's purpose. Okay? Anybody have any questions about purpose or the case study that, that we went through? <laughs> 